Okay, well, hello, David. It's fantastic to have you here on the Earth Speaks podcast. Thank you for agreeing to come on the show. <laughs> Absolutely, I'm happy to be here. Yeah, it's, it's wonderful. I, I first heard about, uh, about you and the Regen Tulum project because I'm in, involved in, in regeneration as well and I've been working on my, my website and, and all this, um, just, uh, just a major uh, repurposing this year. And, uh, and I love Mexico. I've spent a couple of years living there and I'm aware of some of the great projects in Tulum. So when I, when I saw that article, I thought, oh my God, I really, I just have to talk to you. So thank you again. And um, yeah, so I guess before we start um, with, with some of these questions, I'm just gonna run through your biography, which I'm sure doesn't cover everything, but um, just to sort of put us all into the picture a little bit. Um, I wanna share on, on David's vision and his contributions thus far, and, and then we'll segue into the Regen Tulum project. So, as he has shared with me, and I'll share with you all now, that David's most important identifier is being a father, is being Papa. So since earning his BS and MS in engineering at Stanford, David has had leadership roles in startups, nonprofits, and social enterprises in emergent fields. As a shift shaper, his work focuses on building collective wisdom and altering systems of consciousness for positive impact. David worked on decentralization in the early 2000s, focusing on energy, food, and water, and on building local communities. Now his focus is systems that raise consciousness and vibration and enable the coordination needed to address humanity's existential threats. As founder of Bridget and coiner of the MetaWeb, David is building an ecosystem that revolutionizes how we think about the web by enabling presence and computation above the web page. He co-founded Regen Tulum with Mitch Cuervo as a decentralized public works movement to regenerate Tulum. He is an author and the executive producer of the first of its kind augmented reality book, Pacha's Pajamas, a story written by nature that features Moss Dev, Talib Koeli, and Cheech Marin. David is a Royal Society of the Arts Fellow, active dreamer, active dreaming teacher, soul, soul collage facilitator, Green for All Fellow, founder gym graduate, and a warm data labs host. So that's a lot of stuff. Welcome again. And uh, yeah, I just love you to. You know, just let, let us know, I guess, about this, like being a father, and then maybe the steps that, that led you to the, the project of Regen Tulum in, uh, in 2021. Wow. <laughs> yeah, being a father has just been transformative for me. Yeah. yeah. And I would say that being a father is one of the signposts as well, that are important in this Regen Tulum journey, which is really part of a much bigger journey, which is about catalyzing the regenesis, being, being an active participant in catalyzing the regenesis. Yeah. So I, I'll just start with what I'm thinking of as the first signpost for this Regen Tulum journey. Yeah. I came to Tulum 25 years ago. I was visiting Cancun with my friend Edwin. We spent a lot of our time in Cancun, which I didn't particularly like that much. Um, we did also go to Chichen Itza, and thankfully, we came down to Tulum for about three hours or so. At that time, Tulum was a sleepy fishing village yeah. with some beautiful rooms. I spent about two hours in one of those temples. Yeah. I guess back in the, the day, you could actually go in and, and be in the ruins. So I was there meditating. I had just recently started meditating at that point. Uh -huh. So it was really early in my 
mindfulness journey. Yeah. Anyway, what was special about that moment, for the first time ever, I felt the energy of a land, or at least the first time in my adult life. I'm sure when I was a kid, yeah, I just intuitively had that because I was out, out running about and camping and all those things. But somehow the system that we're in really had just taken that out of me. And mm -hmm. when I came to Tulum, it was a totally new feeling to sense the energy of a place. And I was excited about that. That's why I sat there and I meditated for two hours. I'd never done that before. Yeah. I don't know what my friends were doing at that time. <laughs> what ruins were you in? Where were you in Tulum? It was the, the main archaeological site. Oh, the one right there on right the on the beach. Oh, yeah, right on yeah. the beach. Yeah. Yeah. It was magical. And yeah. that feeling stuck with me. But it kind of receded over time because things happened in my life. I had a daughter. Yeah. And about two weeks into that, her mother put her on my chest. So this little tiny baby, and she just inched up into my neck and I felt her, smelt her, heard her. Yeah. And all of a sudden this feeling went all through my body, a pulse of energy. I knew that I was a new person. Wow. I knew that this was the most important relationship in my life, but I didn't know how I had changed. I knew I had changed, but I didn't know yeah. how. And this was 25 years ago. This was, this was 19 years ago. Right. Okay. Yeah. So all these, this was a little bit after the Tulum. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And about two weeks after that experience, I realized that I need to be able to look her in the eyes when she's a young adult and tell her that I did everything that I could to make this a more beautiful, loving, and peaceful place. Yeah. That catapulted me on the quest. <laughs> that's been 19 years now. And it, and it brings me to this very interview. <laughs> <laughs> love that like all the synchronicities and signposts absolutely yeah. well okay so, so that's so where, just, where did you start i better back up so where were you born first uh, yeah i don't I even know that born in san francisco that's raised in berkeley and i lived in oakland for the last 22 years right okay. until tulum yeah now i live in tulum i've been here for about six plus months right yeah okay well so continue on so you had this major shift and all these signposts okay signpost number three <laughs> last year and i'm sure there's other ones there's a ton of other ones that are also important but i'm going for the major ones that actually got me here to tulum last year june yeah my bank account got down to one cent yep <laughs> not not seven cents yeah. not negative 15 dollars and 32 cents yeah one cent i did not engineer this i looked into my bank account statement online and yeah. it said you have one cent that's crazy to me i mean it's just yeah. mind-blowing what's the chances of that yeah well, synchronicity, I guess, is very high. <laughs> so what that told me, I mean, I took that as, okay, this is a message from the universe. I mean, something as special as getting down to one cent. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, this is, this is a, just a signpost. This is a cairns. Yes. This is a stack of rocks along yeah. my path. Yeah, and that's right. I had to figure out what I was going to do differently. Yeah. And it wasn't like the greatest news, obviously, right? <laughs> I had hoping there was a little bit more when I went yeah. in there. <laughs> but, but I always like, want to ask myself, well, how could this be the best thing ever? Yeah. And oh, I don't know, having one cent in the bank account, it's not really easy to think about how that could be the best thing ever. But if it actually prompts a major change in one life, then... Maybe it is, right? 
So that's the the thought process I'm going to. I'll say, what what kind of change do I need to make in my life? What what's on the table now? Okay. Well, (laughs) maybe I can sell my house. Yeah. Been living here 22 years. I want to have money for my projects. My daughter's daughter's 19 at this point. I don't really need to stick around here all the time. She doesn't have that much time to see me anyway. Yeah. Maybe uh-huh. I sell my house. I've always wanted to live abroad. Hmm. <laughs> I mowed over it a couple couple months and I decided to go for it. So I sold my house and then wow. I wasn't really sure what I was going to be. So I, I moved in with my mom and was helping her. She was going through some hard times. Yeah. Uh, you know, basically, her school was transitioning from um, not doing anything because of COVID to online yeah. learning. And she's not really a computer yeah. person. So I yeah. moved in with her and was helping her through that. Um, wasn't really sure where I was going to land, if I was going to leave or what. I ended up going to Puerto Rico to a event called Goldfin- Goldfinger. It's a okay. um, in-person deal club. And I liked, I liked uh, Puerto Rico. I did. I did. And I thought to myself, well, I could live here, maybe, Um, especially that six months thing where you can pay no taxes virtually. So that was kind of a consideration. I came back. It wasn't totally sold. Then I went to Tulum in May for a New Earth Now mastermind gathering and another green finger, this one in Tulum. Both of these happened to be right at the same place eco retreat center called Paladora. Yeah. But I wasn't planning on staying. I had a one-way ticket. I knew that I'd probably be doing some traveling, but I thought I'd go somewhere else after Tulum. Yeah. When I was in Tulum, I said, oh, okay, well, I'll stay a little bit after these events. No, let's give it a four or five days. Then, you know, four days into it. I'll give it a couple of weeks, a couple of weeks into it. <laughs> well, I'll give it, you know, two or three months. What I was looking for was a situation where I could bring my talents. I have these projects. So I have Pachas Pajamas that's rebooting now. I have the Presence Browser, um, Presence Labs, which is creating a new level of the internet. Yeah. And I've always been involved with regeneration. So I was thinking to myself, well, if there is a place, if Tulum is that place, where I can land and I can actually use what I have. I can bring my projects. I can help in some way, then then I'll stay. And another signpost was meeting, um, well, my friend Christina helped me find a place in uh, La Valenta. And I don't know, I was just being lazy, I guess. I, I hadn't really looked for a place in a long time. Like I said, I was living in yeah. my house for 22 years and I just didn't, I don't know, I wasn't really motivated and she had went on Telegram or WhatsApp and found a place and said, oh, why don't you go to this place? It's beautiful, it's got a lot of nature, it's pretty yeah. inexpensive. Went over there, it's like, sure, why not? <laughs> I mean, I could have I could have looked around, I'm sure I could have found something else, you know, but this was cool yeah. and I don't know. <laughs> I was just following synchronicity. I mean, that's, that's how I'm doing my life now. I, it's like, okay, well, let me do this one. Let me see. Interestingly, another signpost, and a couple of days later, I met me. She's my next door neighbor. <laughs> one day, uh, I think that the power went out, and I didn't have any candles. She she came out, gave me a candle. That was yeah. just really short interaction. And then. A couple of days later, I came and I said, hey, would you like to go to dinner? We went to dinner and she was telling me all about Tulum. And she didn't just tell me the great things. She told me some of the problems. So I I learned that Tulum is heading for ecological collapse. It's becoming more and more like Cancun and Mm -hmm. uh, Playa, which have destroyed their environment, their ecological systems and become pretty much like large shopping malls and huge hotels. Yeah. So um, yeah, that, that, was, that was a big eye opener for me because I had been hearing 
for a long time about how ecological Tulum was and its eco destination. Yeah. So uh, to hear that it had all these problems was really surprising and also very interesting. And then she sent me this movie called The Dark Side of Tulum. So I'll say that those are the main signposts that really got me engaged. I knew at that point that there's some things that we could do because I saw that the regenerative um, movement that was present in Tulum was completely disconnected. People found out things by WhatsApp and tape, Facebook, which are both ephemeral. There wasn't any central spot to figure out things. So that was like the first entry. There needs to be something like Yelp for regeneration in Tulum. Yeah. So that was where we started. Right. And this is Mitch uh, Cuervo. That's uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah. And I'm really picking up there that, you know, as she's sort of sharing that side of Tulum, the dark side, as it were, it sort of, um, I, I can imagine it would have maybe felt or triggered a sense of um, like, you know, being like a race against time. There's all these, you know, amazing eco progressive initiatives going on there. At, but then there's this whole uh, Cancunizing, you know, uh, side of things that are just, you know, basically chewing up everything. So I, I can imagine that's like a real, like, uh, yeah, okay, something needs to be done. Yeah, absolutely. And yeah. beyond the fact that Tulum has already outgrown its urban infrastructure by a factor yeah. of four yeah. in 2023 wow there's going to be the mayan train coming and an airport for tulum yeah. so it's going to be even yeah. more people coming so we really need to have a change in not only mindset but in behavior and systems and governance yeah. By 2023. Yeah. So we have yeah. one year basically to really shift things here in, in Tulum. Yeah. Okay. Well then let's dive into like the the components then and the structure of Regen Tulum. Yeah. Well, Regen Tulum is designed to be a decentralized autonomous movement. Yeah. Or a, a DAO. It just it's going to be working on a decentralized autonomous this organization software, we're not sure exactly which one right now. Uh, right now, the two main aspects of uh, Regen are the council. So we have a council of eight people and we have a couple of advisors as well. We're gonna be bringing on many more advisors. We're gonna be bringing on more council members as well. And then we have the larger community. And some of the people in the larger community are on our WhatsApp channel. Others are connected to us through Facebook and Instagram. So there's, there's this uh, <clears throat> presence in uh, social presence that we have. We do uh, frequent events. Some of them are developer talks, uh, regenerative developer talks. We also do educational events as well. We're about to start doing some events around DAOs and NFTs. We've been actually been doing a fair amount of virtual events around NFTs. There's a lot of ex excitement around NFTs as yeah, well. Yeah. This, this idea around a decentralized movement is the possibility for us to shift this uh, social change um, approach from a, a bunch of disconnected nonprofits that are overworked, underpaid, burning out, um, sometimes duplicating efforts yeah. to yeah. a decentralized movement where hundreds, if not thousands of people and organizations are self-organizing yeah. to do activities and actions that support regeneration in Tulum. That's really the vision of this. And we see the DAO or, or a dam being really the structure for it because DAOs are essentially a, a software on the blockchain that allow communities to allocate resources. That's what they do. You put in proposals and the community votes on the proposal. If it, if it is approved, then the funds are allocated and the people do the project and report back. We need one of those in, yeah. in Tulum. And we think of that as decentralized public works. Yeah. 
So if the city's not doing what needs to be done, well, maybe the city, I mean, maybe the community can step up and do exactly. it. Exactly. Yeah. But but that requires a funding source. Yeah. And that was really the hardest part for me. Um, I mean, we had this idea of the directory. Of course, it makes sense. Let's connect all the projects so people can find out about volunteer efforts and can find out um, about what hotels have done, regenerative aspects like solar panels, et cetera, um, what restaurants are using local food. You know, we could yeah, put that that's together. Easy. That's yeah. kind of obvious. Yeah. And then, it, yeah, DAOs are, are a thing now. So it makes sense for us to be able to, to have the community vote on what gets done. But how do you fund it? And there's a lot of ways you can do it. Okay, donations, sponsorships, um, different, you know, we could come up with things to sell. There, yeah. There's a lot of different standard things we could do. But I, I was thinking, well, what could we do that would be Web3? that would take advantage of the new technologies. And yeah. then I'm saying, well, maybe it's a, some kind of complementary currency or maybe it's exactly. a community currency. Yeah. But community currency, that's actually not new technology, right? right? Community currencies have been around 6,000 years. Yeah. I mean, they were predating national currencies, yeah. right? Before yeah. we had nations, we had communities that had currencies. But now there's this possibility of Web3 community currencies, community currencies on the blockchain. Exactly. So better security, better authentication, uh, being able to reward people for actions, being able to value things that aren't being valued now, being able to keep the money circulating in the community. So we are not totally set on this, but we do have a, a white paper, and I would invite all of your listeners, if they're interested in community currencies, if they're interested in regeneration, if they're interested in blockchain, if they're interested in helping our project and giving their, their ideas, I would encourage them to weigh in on our white paper. It is, yeah. I, I'll, I'll give, give yeah, you the information if you me, can post it. put it in the links, yeah. But basically, what we are envisioning now is a community currency called Tulum Coin, yeah. where 3% of every transaction goes to a regenerative project fund that's yeah. voted on by the people. So the people get to vote on what regenerative projects get funded. Yeah. I mean, simple. It may change. There's some other different ways to channel money, like demurrage. So we're going to look at that as well. Uh, we're still a little ways away from being able to actually implement a community currency. It's going to take some money. So we're going to actually need to finance the financing mechanism. Yeah. <laughs> and how we're intending to do that is NFTs. Yeah. There's a lot of excitement around NFTs at this point in Tulum, we've been getting together, you know, 10 to 15 people on a weekly basis. I am now engaging with, I think it's almost a dozen artists now who oh, either that live. That so fantastic. I love that. I love it. Yeah. And I, I just keep, what keeps coming in is this incredible empowering opportunity to bank the unbanked you know people that are just been out of the system and shunted out by big business or disconnected as you know as part of the colonial structures and and, and whatnot and to really dive into the communities and bank the unbanked but then also to you know to bring forward the artists in this way with with nfts or you know musicians and, and all of that as that way to you know to build this really thriving community that is then you know on the blockchain as well are you guys going to have your like your own constitution as such or do you have a constitution for the project like your own nation so to speak yeah well we have um we have values and yeah. we're creating, formally creating a DAO. It hasn't happened yet, yeah, but we're yeah. in process right now. Yeah. And that DAO will be responsible for creating all of the 
artifacts and other things that define the organization. So I'm excited about th that constitution being built if that's what the community wants to do. And I, and I actually think it will be. So that's yeah. one of the reasons I haven't put in a, a lot of effort to try to like get that started or anything because it feels like it's a really good thing for people within the DAO to take on. Yeah, and then it just flashed in too because I have this dream of uh, walking the, the Camino and um, I'm on some sort of Camino, you know, whatever. And, um, you know, because of COVID and, and travel issues, you know, you can, you can basically travel the Camino virtually or Machu Picchu. And I'm just thinking, gosh, I mean, that would be amazing to take people on these virtual tours and they pay for that, but what a great way to then fund the project, you know? Yeah, I mean, that's a great idea, actually. I think Tulum would be perfect oh, for yeah. that. There's someone here, actually a couple of people here that are really interested in doing a metaverse of Tulum. Yeah, um, exactly. Yeah. 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 You know, and so people that would be that really are somewhere interesting else have that are, you know, uh, that they can, you know, like be sort of in that virtual space with indigenous people creating their art or or going into the ruins and, you know, just that whole metaverse thing that uh, is going to explode along with the NFTs. So, wow, this is just so exciting. I'm really excited for you all. Yeah. It's really quite exciting for me as well. I'm wanting to see the council be something that is a, of, of a limited lifetime. Yeah. I see it being progressive decentralization and yeah. the council's job really would be to set up the initial governance structure and to get things moving yeah. and then to start pushing more and more of the decision making to the community. That's what is really exciting to me, that notion of, well, it doesn't even have a council. It's, it's an org organization that well, it's a movement that's run by the community. Exactly. And if something needs to be done, it isn't a matter of begging, you know, the government. It's just, you know, the, the people decide the, the road needs to be built or we need to create this. And as you say, like a self-funding, self-governing, self-organizational structure that yeah. just attends to everything. Well, I want you to take me through now, because this was in that Regen Tulum article, and you said that how you felt about the, the project was that it was in alignment with two timelines relating to South American prophecies. And I'm aware of, um, because of my, uh, my background of like the Mayan fifth world and the Aztec sixth sun, all to do with regeneration and renewal of, of humanity. So can you take us through those guiding prophecies and, and principles of your particular, um, the, the South American ones that have really um, catalyzed you? Yeah, absolutely. And I will say that it appears like this line of thinking has happened all across the earth that yeah. original peoples mm -hmm. of all different or many different nations have similar prophecies to the ones that I'm speaking of. And the ones that you've just spoken about are absolutely in complete alignment as well. So mm -hmm. the one that came to me 20 odd years ago, well, right around the time that my daughter was born, interestingly, and maybe that's another signpost, yeah. is the eagle and the condor. Okay. Yeah. And I found out about that through the, the Pachamama Alliance. Yep. Yeah and the story of Lynn Twist and how she got called into the jungle through uh, ayahuasca ceremony, yeah. <laughs> which is, but the calling was done through dreams. Actually, the, the people that called her, they yeah. called her through dreams, which just lit me up <laughs> at the time. <laughs> And it, it inspired me to really find out more about this eagle and the condor, which was something that they were bringing out 
that prophecy. And the notion is back in ancient times that everybody were the people of the condor, the people of the heart, the more feminine, the more spiritually um, guided people, more spiritually advanced people. There came a time in, in the Incan tradition when there were group or groups of people that wanted to go off on their own path. And these people were seen as the people of the eagle. They were more mind-centered. They were more masculine, energetically leaning and more uh, focused on technological advancement. And it was said back at that time, mm -hmm. it was said that in the last 500 years, yes. that the, the 500 years that just recently passed, that the people of the eagle would bring the people of the condor to the brink of extinction. Yes. But, but <laughs> if the eagle and the condor could fly together in the same skies, that it would bring balance to the planet. Yeah. And that just hits me so hard. Because what it's saying is basically if we can take the best of our spiritual lives. Yeah and we can take the best of technology and bring those together, then there's some possibilities. And I found a role for myself in that. And I've, I've placed myself in, in the unfolding of that prophecy. Yeah. Okay, so that's one. Yeah. And then number two is this Pachacuti. And I, I think it's very much related it says that there was the, there are these 500 year periods, which corresponds to the other one as well. And the last one before the one we're in now started in 1492, went to 1992. Interesting, 1492, that's uh, the time that, that oh, the yeah. Europeans and yeah. Columbus and them Columbus. started to come to the new world. Yeah. And, um, 1992 is also quite interesting. So that's the beginning of the of the one that we're in right now. Yeah. That's pretty much the beginning of the web. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you could argue that maybe it was 91 or the proposal was it, it was 1989, but 92 was right around when the yes. web was emerging. So I, I find that pretty interesting as well. So the, the Pachikuti um, prophecy is coming from the Incas as well, or yeah. somewhere in, in that basin in, um, in Peru yeah. and Bolivia. And it's saying that in this time, there are going to be the new humans. Yeah. The new humans that are spiritually advanced and um that recognize their connectedness with each other and with themselves as well as with nature that yeah. this notion of relations and connectedness is is really important it's yeah. always spoken about by the original peoples yeah i i agree and um um before um, 2012, which, you know, as you know, is all tied in with, with the Mayan prophecies. Uh, I did a lot of traveling and uh, used to speak a lot about the, the, the different calendars and the different structures, uh, indigenous prophecies of, you know, that it's the, the Cherokee or it's the Tibetan or Indian and, you know, and how they were all pointing to this time frame. And we've been in that, you know, bridge since um, say 2012, but it was pointing to the renewal and regeneration of both human beings as well as the earth. And it would be like, you know, be really messy as with all the, the bridges to another time uh, are, are very messy, but it had to do with the, the raising of, of consciousness and awareness. And what I'm finding right now, because I've, I've also been an astrologer for many years, that you know technology is a really really big part of of where we're going and um and a lot of people are frightened of 
of technology and I guess more of that transhumanist, you know, cold, sterile agenda, which we see unfolding on the planet too. But intuitively, in my meditations, I always get technology coming to me in a very warm and embracing and very expanded way that always says to me, don't be afraid, because it's just a different form of technology, like fire is a technology, we've always had technologies, money is a technology, it's how it's used. But the other side of the astrology is um, Uranus in Taurus, and that is all about the electrification of our own energy fields and our bodies. It's a reconnection with the earth and the earth's rhythms and vibrations and frequencies. And so it really is taking us to like back to what the indigenous have always known and held, but fast forwarding it into you know, another uh, vision that is taking us into these, into these prophecies, into these other kinds of dimensions, you know, and possibilities. So when you're, when you're talking about these on the ground projects, and then marrying that with blockchain, and your own, like regen coin, you know, that's exactly where this is going. You know, it's tremendous. Yeah yeah for sure yeah so I, I love it so for you i mean you know as we look around on the planet what do you see as i guess the i was gonna i, I the question that i had here is the greatest environmental issues but let's just say uh, i might skip forward to here like um around say humanity's actions that you know we've done all these uh, crazy things, you know, in the last cycle of the 500 years of impacting our oceans and land and fisheries and each other. What do you, I, I guess, from a, a philosophical or even spiritual perspective or cultural perspective, what do you think the root causes? What is this destructive aspect of us? But I think if we go back to what the original people say, they say yeah. relationships are the most important thing. It's all yeah. about how things are related. And you know that, right? Through your, yeah. through your studies. Yeah. I believe that the root cause is our separation. Yeah. And our seeing ourselves as separate from one another from nature i think those those perceptions of separateness enable us to act in ways that yeah. have externalities that end up hurting things that we're actually connected to but because we don't believe it fully within ourselves it doesn't really register so i I would say that that is one of the main root causes. I would also venture to say that the web as it's structured right now is not capable of supporting the level of connection, coordination, and collaboration that's needed to address our existential threats. Oh, okay. And that's important because the web is the only tool that could do it. Yeah. So unless we have a working web that actually supports these, it's actually not gonna happen. And don't think that the metaverse is gonna solve this. I know that Mark Zuckerberg says that and maybe some other people says that the metaverse is the, is the next thing. Like it's the evolution of the mobile internet. Yeah. Um, the metaverse 
is not going to help us do a lot of the things that we need to do. It, I think it's going to be really good kind of uh, as a much, much, much better Zoom. And there'll be a lot of entertainment that can happen. I also think it could be great for education in some ways. Yeah. It can't be the entire education being done on the metaverse. The, what I see with the metaverse as being the big missing feature is really text, elegantly dealing with text. And what I mean to say is the metaverse is not grounded on text. The web is, is grounded on text. It means that we can look on the same page and agree that it says something. Okay. In the metaverse, everything is ephemeral, it's videos. And I mean, yeah, certainly you'll be able to bring up web pages, but it's going to be very awkward to do so until you can do it voice enabled. And then when you bring it up, you get this crappy web that we have. I mean, if we allow the web to stay the same. So anyway, I think one of the roots of our problems at this point, not ancient, but at this point is yeah. the misconfiguration of the web that's basically been due to limited thinking and just uh, the, the trajectory so far. It doesn't mean that it has to stay this way. And I'm actually working actively on this on this part of the problem. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so yeah. Are you saying that are you saying that the web as it exists right now is is still not connective enough? So like is it still coming out of the old separation? consciousness is, is that what um i'd love you to dive like what because i don't know you know and uh, i'm sure a lot of people don't know so are you saying it's disconnected from what needs to happen on the ground in order for human beings and the earth to move into this new time frame i am saying that but that's really okay. a consequence of it being completely fragmented so information is in silos because okay, yeah. most commercial sites don't want to use links anymore. So they'll either link back into their own site or they'll link to some kind of affiliate site somewhere where they're going to get value for doing providing the link. Mm -hmm. People are in filter bubbles and people are in search bubbles. So yeah. everything that you do of import on the web is within a silo. This, okay. yeah. this means that we're so mm -hmm. far from being connected on the web. I mean, okay, yes, yeah. Facebook allows us to connect with our friends and family. Well, we actually need to connect with the other people that can be the missing pieces of the project that we have in our mind that's going to help regenerate our neighborhood <laughs> or our town or the nearby park or whatever. We, we need to find those people who are ready to jump in and start you know, mm -hmm. working on something and, and creating change where it needs to happen locally in, in, our, in our living spaces, in our areas, in the places that, that we spend our time. So you're talking about like, a, like the movement of movements, but it needs to be translated um, or connected into the web so that everyone is, is connected in that really you know, momentum filled, empowered way. Is that, is that what you're saying? I am. I don't see it as one movement though. Yeah. I think it, or movements within you know, movements. Yeah. What's that? Sorry, movements within the greater movement of like, if the greater movement is regeneration and rebirth um, as an umbrella, are you then saying there are movements within movements within that greater movement that has everyone connected and going forward? Yes, I think nested networks and movements okay. are the future, yeah. for sure. Yeah. And mm. I think that there's no way to do this with the existing web as we have conceived it. But the interesting thing is that the internet yeah. is inherently connecting and it's inherent, inherently feminine energetically because it's all about connecting machines that's the internet but yeah. the web we we see the web as this flat static thing that uses one or two layers yeah. and when i say layers, i mean okay the, for the first layer is the content that the author put on the page and the second layer is the advertising that might 
pop up. <laughs> yeah. so those, those, those things that pop up, that's another layer. And we can find our thinking of the web to pretty much that. I mean, that's not 100% true because there's this notion of, of extensions, browser extensions, which allow you to access another layer of the web. So there's hypothesis, which does mm. social education. What's interesting to me is that yeah. Well, in 2012, Mark Andreessen, who's this big venture capitalist at Andreessen Corwitz technology venture firm. But the more interesting thing is that he is the father of the browser. He built with a team, led a team to build Mosaic at the University of Champaign, Illinois. Yeah. And he also was a co-founder of Netscape. And right. okay. But yeah. he, in 2012, when he was buying Rap Genius, is that the web has a big missing feature. Do you know what that is? Annotation. So he said, the big missing feature of the web is the ability to layer knowledge on top of knowledge. The, the web was always conceived. Even before the web was conceived, they had this notion of annotation. When Vannevar Bush, as we may think, when he was conceptualizing computers, 1945, he was seeing what he called associative trails between pieces of information. Um, in 19, eight, 1969, mother of all demos, Douglas Engelbart, when the mouse was introduced, annotation was thought as part of this system. The Internet mm. had annotation, Tim Berners-Lee, the proposal for information management to CERN, 1989. Annotation was in there too. And it was in, like I said, in Mosaic as well, the, the first web browser. So annotation was in there until 1995 when Netscape was going head to head with Microsoft. Microsoft, Microsoft was preloading Internet Explorer on all the PCs, which was 90% of the market at the time, for free, yeah. which mm. was a competitive disadvantage for Netscape. But not only that, Andreessen said in that 2012 article, they didn't have a place to store the data, the annotation data. It couldn't be on the web servers where mm. the web page was stored. They didn't have access to that. They just had access to the browser. They, they were the browser. Uh, okay. So what would they do with it? There was no cloud. There's no peer-to-peer. Where would you put it? So he said, yeah, we probably could have solved it, but you know, it just wasn't the time. So in 1995, we lost annotation. And God. annotation is not the big missing feature though of the web. It's necessary, but not sufficient. The big missing feature is computation above the web page. I call the space above the web page, I call that the meta web. And okay. you can have not only putting Mm. words and things on top of the web on the web page attaching it to pieces of content like hypothesis like digo and several other different annotation tools allow you to do right now but you can put computations any kind of computations on top of the web i envision the space above the web the meta web being a yeah. decentralized digital space that's where we create the solidarity mm -hmm. movement i'm already in contact with the yeah, yeah. Uh, people in Brazil. I'm in contact with the Mother Earth uh, delegation. Um, and I'm looking to connect with more original peoples as well about a solidarity network that yeah, is yeah. built from this ancient wisdom and includes all the allies and the people. The people who come down to the jungle to do ayahuasca with the exactly. Yawanawa yeah. people and the, the Huni Queen and who go to Peru and the people who come to Tulum to have medicine journeys and the people who are studying um, ancient wisdom and all of the people who feel that connection and understand the importance of these teachings, we could have our own layer above the web page. Mm -hmm. When you go to a web page, so let's say you go to a web page, and you know maybe maybe the movement has advanced quite a bit, and it's it's a it's a page that's talking about an action that's coming up. 
to um, to activate one of the sacred sites, let's say. Yeah. Well, what's cool about having your own layer on top of the web, if you, Fatima, come to this page and decide to go visible, you can see everyone else who's visible on that page at the same time, who's yeah. within this digital nation. Yeah. yeah. So you will be able to see their profiles and say, oh, wow, oh, there's David. Maybe you don't know me by then. Oh, there's David, oh. And I see that, oh, he's doing this project called Regen Tulum. And they're looking to regenerate Tulum with the decentralized autonomous organization. Oh, wow. Well, maybe I'd like to have him on my show. Um, now there's someone else here. And there's an elder from this, from this, um, this tribe that I've been meaning to talk to someone from. Mm, um, yeah. Maybe there's a friend there. You know, your friend, meaning your friend is there. You didn't know that they were at the same page as you at the same time. Or maybe maybe they were there three days ago, but you can see that they were there three days ago and they were at the same place, meaning that they're focused. They, they spent some significant time reading something that you're also really interested in. This is a friend that you haven't talked to in a month, maybe, or maybe a week or whatever, but you now know that their mind is interested in exactly what you're interested in and has probably read something in detail that you've read recently as well, and could be the basis mm. for starting up the next conversation. Wow. So yeah, I've, I've never heard this before, you know, expressed in this way. And it, you know, it really, um, to me, and this is like sort of coming back to some of these questions of like, if we're talking about, are these changes happening fast enough or at pace in terms of, you know, uh, the Amazon burning down and what they're doing with, with everything that's, you know, going on with the old consciousness. It, it feels like what you're talking about there with the meta web and through that pathway of annotation is that, I don't know, umbrella or organized organizational structure that enables people to tap in, in this really um switched on diverse immediate real-time conscious informational reality that you know is working so fast with all the different communities then that's the thing like a uh i don't know a train or a chariot or a, you know a, a vehicle that then can spearhead this this group or these groups of people so that we continue yeah. to leave behind these the, the silo thinking that has got us into these uh well you know has created a lot of amazing things of course over these hundreds and thousands of years but now is that time according to all the prophecies of regeneration and renewal so we're we are needing the the birth and the invention of these new pathways in order to accommodate who we've become and who we are becoming in order to take ourselves and the earth and humanity as a collective into a new space i love that i've, I've just i've never heard that this is totally news to me totally new yes. to me it's kind of new to me as well i mean i've been yeah. on it for about four years but the the evolution yeah. of the thinking is and we're just yeah. getting it built now. The reason why it's taken wow. four that? years, Silicon Valley, was no help at all. They were completely dismissive of me. They yeah. ignored me when they weren't dismissing me. They, uh, they let me pitch, never gave me, you know, didn't let me win. They didn't let me in accelerators. They didn't let me in incubators. They didn't give me any funding. Yeah. I pitched over and over and over these ideas. And just to be fair, it didn't have everything that it has now, yeah. but this could have been done way sooner. And okay. the interesting thing for me is, as I said, I always ask, well, how could this be the best thing ever? Well, I'm so overjoyed that they did it. I'm so overjoyed that, that Silicon Valley is not on my That's right. cap no. sheet. Oh, I'm so <laughs> Oh my God. But it took way longer than it, it, it could have happened if um if we got support. So I, I just say now I say let's go again, Sally. But um someone will have to figure out what I mean by that. Um because yeah. I can't really see 
online. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, so it, we really progressed. So it's, what I told you about was on-page presence. It also, this meta web has the possibility of allowing us to build knowledge together yeah. by connecting pieces of information. And so the other aspect of is on-page interactions and the most important one is what I call a bridge. Yeah. So a bridge is a conceptual link between a piece of content on one page to a piece of content on another page with a relationship. So you can imagine mm -hmm. a contradicting bridge from a sentence in a news article that speaks to something about, say, it could be around the original peoples, or it could be about some regenerative technology, or it could be about anything. And then, so it's a contradictory bridge from that sentence to a segment in video where the person in the video is saying something that directly contradicts what was written in that sentence. Yeah. And this possibility of having bridges means that we could bring context back to the web so when you're focusing on something as you move your focus towards something that has information in this meta web this meta layer yeah. it could light up it highlights and a, and a circle pops up with a number in it you click that number and it shows you an overview of everything that's directly related to that piece of information so you could see supporting bridges and contradicting bridges. You could see wow. meetings that people yeah. are having or had. You could see polls. You could see conversations. You yeah. could see whatever a developer decides they think would be valuable for people to attach to a piece of content. Right. That is just meta web, super web, super connectivity. Yeah, That's and computation above the web page. That is computation above the web page. We don't yeah. have it now, and there's no reason that we don't have it other than a, a lack of, of 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 imagination. And why? Because we're living in an attention economy. And yeah. every company that's not well, every every company that's being built for the attention economy will never come to this. Yeah. They will never come to this. I'm, I'm only coming to it because I think the attention economy sucks. And I think it takes away our cognitive freedom because we're fragmented and then algorithms decide what we see. Yeah. Where's the freedom in that? There, I don't really see it. Do you know how many fake accounts that fake book took down in 2019 and 2020? No. Yes, they have 3 billion users. Oh my God. <laughs> Throw out a number. Oh, I don't I don't know. You tell me. Okay. Six billion. Really? Yeah. They took down six billion in 2019. They took down six billion in 2020. Wow. And that at any given point, five percent of all the accounts, active accounts, are fake. Right. So that's 150 million accounts. Yeah. It doesn't take a lot of accounts to make something go viral. It certainly doesn't take 150 yeah. million. So we're seeing yeah. what other people want us to see. Yeah. Well, and I think, you know, in the last couple of years as well, all of that has become even more clear, you know, with, uh, uh, with the whole COVID narrative. And, uh, you know, we're certainly seeing that playing out at large in terms of the deplatforming of, of all kinds of, of people. So that, you know, the, uh, so information is being controlled and, and sanitized. And I think that that's one of the gifts. There's a lot of gifts, I think, in, in the last couple of years. But one of the greatest gifts that has really been mobilizing a lot of people, and certainly here in Australia, is, is seeing things more clearly for what they are in terms of that the controlling of narratives and agendas and just keeping the old structures in, in place. And it has translated into 
a major, uh, let's say, split, which to us is looking like a two tier economy, like which actually just started today in my my state where I live in, in Queensland. But what it's done is that it has then spawned all these groups that are then wanting to create their own economies and their own schools and their own markets and their own health systems because they've been shut down or turfed out or they just don't want to participate in the old structure so creatively it's you know shock and grief and fear and you know all that all that stuff but then on the other side of that it's like right well let's get busy what are we going to create so there's all these gifts that are happening now that look they don't look great and they don't feel great when they're happening or like you're saying all this pitching to silicon valley and that sort of landed nowhere but then sometimes i think we're also being protected and we're being catalyzed and we're being protected because the universe also wants this to happen it wants us to grow it's it's been as we say yeah as we know it's been prophesied so there's an expectation that if we partner with this expansiveness and and do this whether it's technologically or spiritually or economically that's what the universe wants and if we know that there's a timing and we can trust that then we're going to have all those synchronicities and the chess pieces are going to to show up so you know we don't have to force it we have to work we have to work hard but we can also i think what i'm finding is kind of see all the players for what they what they are and what they represent you know and every good story you know whether it's lord of the rings or the hunger games or you know any of these stories uh harry potter you always need a voldemort you always need a you know an evil eye sauron to bring out the very best in you know in in people so i mean i feel enormously positive about everything that that's happening that is going to take us to to new places yeah yeah i really like what's happening with web3 i mean i'm not super excited about a lot of the projects that are out there because yeah. it seems like many more. of them really focus simply on on financial gain yeah more that, of the same <laughs> with the nft world as well but but this is how these technologies get developed yeah what i'm doing right now with regen and um also i had my other project uh, you know the one i just told you about with the internet with the web the meta web and then i have another project that's launching actually next week called pachaverse which is basically children's entertainment um story world that we have taken and then brought to the meta we're bringing it to the metaverse and doing nfts and we're going to do an animated series all these would not be possible to be done without without the development of the web3 infrastructure exactly. and that development has happened on the backs of you know some projects that aren't necessarily really in alignment but yeah. it's important that they happen and I mean, maybe it wouldn't be the end of the world if some of them didn't, but I mean, this is how things grow. They don't grow like beautifully all the time and everything you know, easy. That's why they call it the terrible twos. I mean, <laughs> the terrible twos really of, yeah. of the crypto right now. It's, we're a baby right now for yeah, the world, for, for all of it, for DAOs. These are all super important technologies that we're going to be using yeah. in the future to change the world. It's just right now, yeah, I mean, it's it's a growing phase. It so I, I'm positive as well. And that's how I think about what's happening in crypto right now. I think it's necessary, but it doesn't solve, it doesn't solve the meta web thing. I mean, that's yeah. that's a different thing. It'll use crypto. Yeah. But um 
yeah, necess- crypto is necessary, but not sufficient. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, I just wanted, as we're coming sort of to the end here, which we, I think we thought was going to be half an hour. And there's like all these other questions that I could be asking you, but I, I'm, I'm going to stop <laughs> with those ones. But um, I love to ask this one um, about reframing. So, you know, sometimes we think these things are happening to us or because of us, you know, because some people are like, you know, we're, we're bad and we're causing all these, these things. But um, I know you're, you're coming from this um, enlarged perspective too. So if these changes are happening for us, the good, the bad, and the ugly, then what is your 10-year vision? I mean, what would you like to, you know, like if we cast our mind to 2030, 2031, 32, what would you like to see happening? Well, I think it's really important that by that time we have the informational infrastructure and ecology that supports the level of connection, coordination and collaboration that's, that'll enable us to work together to make the changes that we need in the world. And also to have the information so that we can't like just say, oh, I didn't know that, I didn't see that, or I, I don't understand that. No, if, if we create the information ecology where everything is connected and then mm. we, allow or provide the capacity for people who are really interested in delving into those information ecologies for them to actually summarize it and that all that's on the blockchain so you can not only see how people are interpreting it and see like what what exact evidence they're speaking to because all of it is chained together with bridges and everything's on the blockchain and transparent and I, I think if we have that, then it's going to be much harder for people to say, oh, well, I didn't realize that what I was doing is impacting the ecosystem this way. Or I didn't realize that I, I, I could do something or, you know, I didn't realize that, you know, there's a community that's right down the street that's actually meeting and they're making big changes and improving things in the neighborhood. If we mm-hmm. connect all the information, then people I think can be more informed. And if you want, if you want a democratic future, so I'll say 10 years from now, I would like to see an expansion of the democracy experiment. And yeah. I will say right now, I feel it, it's a it's a failure, it's a farce because yeah. democracy is supposed to have an informed populace. Yeah. I don't think that that's, I know that's not happening here. Yeah. And no, it's not I happening don't here know. either. <laughs> it's not happening in Australia either, right? <laughs> right now in the US, it's, it's just two parties. It's like two opinions. Yeah. I think. And okay, if I'm with them, then here's my talking. And if I'm with him, with them, and here's my talking. I mean, yeah. that, there's yeah. no thinking involved. That's yeah. not an informed populace. And what you're informed about is what your party says. Yeah. That's not what informed populist means. So I think that we, I, I'm also hoping that there'll be a restructuring. I don't know if it will happen in every country or even this country. And I'm not talking about Mexico, I'm talking about the US. Yeah. Um, I hope there's a restructuring in how politics happens. I would like to see elections on potential things to do. Like- Yeah, the things that need Google, to be done. Like, yeah. Yeah, here, here's here's five things that we could do for climate change. Which one does the community want to do? That that's what I would love to see us voting on, rather than voting on parties. I think the, yeah. the party thing is is so outdated at this point, and especially going into Web three. I mean, it it just makes it unnecessary because now with DAOs, I mean, we could have a country DAO. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Decide. Yeah what we're going to do, how we're going to run constitution and its own charter and, you know, bill of rights or, or what have you. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 So I would like to see us have a thriving meta web where all the information in the world is connected. I mean, just all the information is connected. Why shouldn't it be? I don't, I don't see any reason why that can't be done. The technology lives right now. We're building it. It is actually, yeah. it's actually 
immutability testing right now. So there's no problem for that. And then there's also some Web3 tools, the graph and other things that we'll be using that, that basically make it very feasible to have a huge graph database that connects all the information and data in the world with valid relationships. And if we have that, that's a big start. So that I, I think that's important. I think being able to have networks within networks that have their own layers on top of the web, I think having a, a metaverse that is functional and doesn't have a ton of fake people out yeah. there seeing everybody exactly. that you're doing it on the web we need to we need to create spaces that are safe that all needs to happen and we need to also lift up the people who have been living on the earth sustainably for tens if not hundreds of millennia they know something about this place now and i'm not saying it's easy to extrapolate everything that they're doing but even if we just took their integral lesson that we're all connected and that we're connected to everything we're connected to nature we're connected to each other and we're connected to ourselves if we just took that little bit right there and took that to heart and then not, once we take it to heart okay, how can we represent that on the web? How can we represent that at our workplace? How can we represent that at our school? How can we represent that in our hospitals? How can we represent that everywhere? I mean, that, that would be a big start. So I think really, you know, getting, getting just that, that, that piece would be really helpful as well. Um, I, I think, we need to be able to understand the externalities that are associated with our actions as well. Like yeah, if I'm going to buy consequences. Product, yeah. Yeah. I need to understand, okay, what are the real uh, ecological impacts and the social impacts? I mean, buying this car versus this car versus renting versus just like sticking with bikes and public transportation. Yeah. Well, that's total transparency and accountability then, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. I think that's it. Transparency and accountability. I love it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, if there's one, one final thing you want to say to our audience <laughs> right now, is there one, one thing? I mean, you, it sounds like your last statements are all a part of, you know, of that, of that one thing, but just, just to encapsulate it. Let's see. Okay. Um, <laughs> well, I, I would say like, First of all, I don't believe anything you read on the web, this web, and don't yeah. accept that. Stand up for a web that works for the unifications of people around yeah. these principles yeah. of connectedness and solidarity and taking care of the earth and taking care of each other. Stand up for a balanced web, a more feminine, feminine web, a connected web. And yeah. um, yeah, I'm so I, I would say that's one thing. And then I, I want to give away for people to reach out to me. So you can reach me at David at Bridget.io. So that's B-R-I-D-G-I-T dot I-O. And a couple of websites are regentulum.com. So it's R-E-G-E-N-T-U-L-U-M dot com. Uh, Presencebrowser.com. And pachaverse.io says p-a-c-h-a-v-e-r-s-e dot i-o and that's my first time being able to spell that one out because the site just went up and it's uh -huh. launching that free books free free nft children's books that are about connectedness so the message of these books is that we're all connected it's told through this amazing story and yeah i'm super excited about being able to speak directly to kids and to be able to make this available for free we're only able to do this because of this you know web3 infrastructure and nfts and and ways that are now possible that i couldn't have done two years ago even that's right that's right. Well, thank you so much. I mean, there's just so many uh, doorways and rabbit holes and sliding doors and all of that that uh, you know we could go down with this plethora of experience and imagination and and your projects. And I just love everything that you're 
about and I know it's the pathway to the future and uh, I really, really thank you for being on Earth Speaks today. It's just been an absolute pleasure to go on this journey with you and I'd love to stay connected with your projects and come back to Tulum and, and check out what you guys are up to. Yes, please do. That's that's amazing. We can put together some kind of event. Fatima mm -hmm. Earth Speaks, when you're talking about things like this and creating doorways for people like myself to express, yeah. it's so important. I really, really appreciate you for the work that you're doing. You. I look forward to meeting you in person one day, yeah. for sure. Yeah, well, the name came to me and uh, I, I'll just briefly, um, uh, before the whole COVID thing happened, because um, I was also running transformational journeys, and um, I had a whole project set up that started off with everyone flying into Cancun and then weaving our way to Tulum. And I was going to take people to all the sites and, uh, and meditate there and, you know, do uh, Temascal and all of that. And in my mind's eye, I had a whole, I don't know what I would say. It was like a, a it was a picture of just that whole area of, of Mexico, the peninsula and all of that. And it was all lit up like a grid. And I really felt that I needed to bring people all around there in order to be there, to meditate. Um, we were going to be plugged into reforestation projects as well. Um, and I really feel a strong connection with that part of the world. So, and Mexico has been calling me a lot recently. So you may see me sooner than, uh, than maybe we both realize. <laughs> wow, what a, what a synchronicity. And I want to yeah. say, so you said Earth Speaks, right? This yeah. is how you framed it. What's really interesting, and it just came to me, is when I set out to write this, these books, um, to participate in this project, uh, I actually am a co-author with a gentleman named Aaron Abelman, who actually had the initial idea for Pacha's Pajamas. So it's this story of a little girl with big dreams. When she goes to sleep, whatever's on her pajamas becomes her dream world. And she ends up going to the forest and you know meets the jaguar, the hummingbird, the whale, the pebble, the tree, and the mushroom, which are all on her pajamas. And they organize this big festival uh, for nature. And it, what she learns through that, that book is that we are all connected. I mean, through that, through that dream journey is that we are all connected. But the interesting thing that comes back to Earth Speaks is when we were thinking about what we wanted to do before we wrote the book, we said our guiding, our guiding light is what would nature say to today's children? Yeah. <laughs> Earth Speaks. Earth Speaks, yeah. Bye. And what would the Earth and it's people's say that, uh, you know, and if we, if we used um, the earth and nature and all of its systems as our models, then we'd solve all the issues. It's already there, you know, yes. it's already there. Absolutely. So, well, I'm gonna stop this recording and just hang on for just a few, a few seconds, but thank you again. I'll, I'm officially uh, saying goodbye. <laughs> to this episode with great great appreciation and uh here we go i'll just stop the recording